This week's theme is the social issue that permeates the day-to-day life of modern Korea. Noise, or to be more precise, noise among neighbors. In any densely populated urban life, a level of noise pollution is somewhat inevitable. It's not a unique issue to Korea at all, but the problem is felt more acutely in Korea. First and foremost, South Korea is very densely populated, with over 500 per one square kilometer. That's easily within the top 10 rank worldwide. The easiest way to house such a dense population has been various forms of flats or apartments. And by today, more than half of the total population live in an apartment, and the number goes up to nearly 80% if we include other forms of smaller multiplex or public forms of lodgings. Virtually almost every Korean lives wall to wall to his neighbor. Unfortunately, various loopholes and loose regulation allows construction companies to get away with minimum soundproofing between apartments or between floors. Without a proper care, the nature of the concrete box construction, which essentially what modern apartments are, can amplify even mere walking around or kid bouncing a light plastic ball to an unpleasant banging noise for the neighbors underneath. It's easy to imagine how stressful that can get for everybody in such a situation. Sadly, when the stress reaches the boiling point, it can turn into a serious conflict between neighbors that sometimes escalates to physical altercation or even a murder. According to a news article on Tonga Daily July this year, there were at least 55 officially recorded cases of violent incident triggered by noise issue in the past decade, and 22 individuals lost their lives as the result. So, today I collected non-paranormal but just as scary real-life stories regarding noise problem. In the first section, I will discuss some of the most horrific cases of violent incidents from recent years, followed by two allegedly true stories that start as seemingly simple case of noisy neighbor but turn out to be much more bizarre and darker. As always, handpicked, translated, and narrated by a host, Anthony. As I mentioned in the intro, the conflict regarding noise issue among neighbors can sometimes escalate to serious violence or even murder. Some may think, how could one kill the other because of mere noise? But noise pollution can really disturb one's life, and if that be the problem in your own home where you need to enjoy peace and rest, it's not a small matter. With the law and authorities still leaving the problem to be resolved between individuals involved, the situation can sometimes go hayway. Here are some of the most gruesome cases of bodily harm and murder triggered by noise issues from the past decade. 2013. For the Lunar New Year, Mr. Lee, then 60-year-old, and his wife welcomed the families of their two sons to their apartment in Myeonmokdong, Seoul. The family was enjoying the usual festivities when, at 5 p.m., got a call from the downstairs neighbor, Song, then 50. She complained about the noise. Mr. Lee's wife seeked her understanding for it being the New Year's Day, but Song wouldn't take it. In the end, the younger of the sons, then 30, took over the call, and it quickly escalated to an argument. He had already saw his father's neighbor complaining harshly whenever he visited his parents with his three-year-old son, and didn't want to take it anymore. All the while, Song's boyfriend, Kim, then 46, was listening to the conversation. There was no resolve, and Song and Kim went upstairs to confront. They didn't even bother to ring the bell, but kicked the door. The younger son confronted them again, and the argument only got heated, with no sign of backing down from either side. Kim then went down to his car, took out the 20 centimeter long knife blade he'd been carrying. He was then chased by a debtor and carried a weapon. 
and called out the younger son of the Lee family to the outside. His older brother, the less confrontational among the two, also followed out to de-escalate the situation. After another threatening back and forth, Kim kicked the older of the brothers down to the ground and stepped his left chest almost to the full length of the blade. A few more blows to his abdomen, right bicep, left shoulder and nose were followed. The younger brother screamed and tried to run, but he slipped on the flower bed and fell. Kim caught him up and stepped his left chest, pierced down to the heart. Again, blows to the abdomen, shoulders were followed, and Kim further kicked him in the face before leaving the scene. Both brothers died on the spot. Kim took his girlfriend's car and ran away. He must have been clearly a psychopathic individual, considering even on the run, he called his debtor to threat that he was coming to kill him too, and then had an overnight drink party with his friends. He managed to stay on the run for four days more before he was arrested. He was subsequently sentenced to lifetime imprisonment, but according to more recent report, he attacked a fellow inmate even in the prison. Mr. Lee, who lost both sons in the most horrible way, died with a shock and grief only 19 days after the incident. Twenty sixteen. Kim, then thirty four year old, living in the apartment in Hanam City, Gyeonggi Province, had been complaining about the noise from his upstairs neighbors, the Chang family. He confronted the family directly a couple of times, but the issue was not resolved, and he planned an attack carefully. He first installed a spy cam facing the door of the upstairs neighbor and from it figured out the password to the door lock. On 2nd July, he entered the Chang family apartment and stepped then 67-year-old Mr. Chang in his left arm and each side of his body, and Chang's wife Pak, 65, in her abdomen. Kim quickly ran away from the scene. Mr. Chang could call the emergency and they were transported to the hospital, but his wife Ms. Pak ultimately passed away. The murder weapon was found in the perpetrator's apartment, and Kim himself was subsequently arrested at a sauna in Incheon. He later stated to the police that living alone with and caring for his ill mother, the stress from the noise was unbearable, especially after Mr. Chang's little grandchildren moved in earlier that year. Kim was sentenced for 30 years' imprisonment. 2021. In the apartment in Yosu City, Cholla Province, lived the Kim family. The husband, 41, and his wife, 39, ran a fried chicken restaurant and worked till late while the wife's old parents took care of their two daughters day to day. Their downstairs neighbor was Chung, 35 year old man. He lived by himself and was a day laborer. To his neighbors, he was a relatively quiet, if somewhat grim-looking guy, except for his constant complaint about the noise from his upstairs neighbors, the Kim family. Even the couple taking a shower after a long day's work was enough to trigger Chung to run up and banging on the door. On 27th September, the Kim couple came back home past midnight and Chong called the husband out once again, complaining about the noise. As soon as Kim came out, Chong wielded his 44 centimeter long machete and beheaded Kim. Chong then walked into the Kim's apartment and also beheaded the wife on her way to run away to the elevator and further cut off one arm of the grandma and slashed the abdomen of the grandpa of the family. The young daughters could save themselves by locking their bedroom door. The aftermath was so gruesome that the first correspondence to the scene required counselling for PTSD. 
During the investigation, they found out that the perpetrator searched for 600 different kinds of knives and weapons on the internet for the period of six months prior to the attack. The machete was purchased that way. Chung was arrested on the spot and subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment. Twenty twenty one, in a small apartment in Sachangdong, Incheon, the Kim family was having unsettling days because of their upstairs neighbor Lee, then forty eight. Lee had been a threatening presence in the neighborhood, spitting sexually charged comments about the daughter of the family and such. Mr. Kim tried to confront him, but it only resulted in Lee becoming more aggressive. He deliberately banged a hammer on his floor to disturb the Kim family downstairs. The Kim family complained to the police four times, but the authority took it as another simple noise case. In that case, there wasn't much ground for the authority to step in legally. At 12.50 p.m., 15th November, Lee once again terrorized Kim's apartment by kicking the door and throwing the package delivered to them. There was just a young daughter home at the time, and she called police. But the police once again took it as just a simple complaint about the noise issue. Only when the daughter insisted that she felt threatened with tears, the officers told Lee to come to the police station for an interview the following day. Three hours later, Lee was once again at Kim's door. The family called police. The first officer took Mr. Kim outside to discuss about the situation, while the second female officer stayed behind with Kim's wife and daughter. But as soon as the men were out, Lee fetched a knife and stabbed the wife up her chin and slashed the daughter's face. The second officer panicked and ran down, while the first officer and Mr. Kim, who heard the screams, were on the way up. Seeing the female officer in panic, the first officer took her outside while Mr. Kim carried on and confronted Lee alone. He managed to hold onto the blade with bare hands, snatched it away from Lee, and hit him with the handle of the knife till Lee passed out. The officers joined in only then and arrested already passed out Lee. This case became notorious not only because of the malicious attack itself, but the police officers' absolutely inadequate dealing with the situation. Rather than protecting the victims and subdue the attacker, they both basically ran away. Kim's wife, who was fatally stabbed, survived, but with cerebral infarction, was rendered paralyzed and speechless, while the daughter was left with a disfiguring scar on her face. Lee was sentenced for 22-year imprisonment, and the two police officers were fired from their positions and sentenced to three-year-long probation. From a few months ago, I started getting a memo stuck on my door from my downstairs neighbor that I was too noisy from early afternoons. I just shrugged because I worked from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. When the same memo continued, I even left a reply memo that it wasn't me. But the situation escalated without resolve, and when one morning I ran into the young couple downstairs, they swore at me. I didn't swear back, but nonetheless shouted back that I wasn't home all day long, didn't I explain I live by myself, no kids, no pet. Shouldn't they then rather suspect the next door or their downstairs neighbor instead? It became a proper quarrel, enough for the concierge to step in. But of course, there was no immediate solution. I read somewhere sometimes noise could jump two floors down, and I myself started suspecting my upstairs neighbor, who wasn't the quietest of the neighbors either. The young couple downstairs finally realized I wasn't lying about not being home all day long, and I saw them complaining to my upstairs neighbor too. Then one day, 
when I had a rare day off. I got an invitation from the young couple downstairs that they'd invite me to lunch at theirs as a sign of apology. So we were enjoying lunch together when the thundering noise rang from the ceiling. It was like somebody hitting a mortar straight on the floor. My flat was clearly empty, so we thought it should be my upstairs neighbor. We all three ran up there, but nobody seemed in there either. Grumbling and wondering, we were heading back down to our lunch, but then realized the noise was banging on from my flat. I rushed in and found a strange guy banging his heel to the floor. I think I have never been so shocked in my life. Police was called in, the young couple stated their accounts, and in conclusion, it all resolved all right. The strange guy in my flat was the former tenant of the place. He had an acrimonious relationship to the young couple downstairs, and it was his revenge to them. I guess it's my fault that I didn't bother to change the lock when I moved in, but how vengeful and obsessive one should really be that he should observe my daily routine and carry on banging the noise for months on. It's truly creepy, should I think about it. A few years ago, I lived in a small studio flat by myself. It was a difficult period of time for me. My previous roommate had stolen my money and run away. And also, I was having a hard time to get used to the new three-shift work schedule. Those alone would have been enough to rob me of sound sleeps. But on top of that, noise from my next-door neighbor made sure that I hardly get any sleep at all. To be more precise, the noise from the washing machine every night from around 11. I am rather sensitive by nature, and any small noise, light pollution, or even less than ideal temperature or humidity would disturb my sleep already. I mean, you'd know if you ever paid attention, but the washing machine cycle is pretty regular. It rolls a few times, then pours, then a few more rolls, then water drains and spins to wring out the water. The volume aside, that irregular nature of the noise was sure to keep me awake all night, though I was dog-tired. I hate to confront others, so for the longest time I try to let it pass. Perhaps my neighbor, a middle-aged woman, had to work till late and that was the only time she could get the washing done, I thought. But that wasn't the case either, because I could hear she'd come back home around 7 or 8 usually. Even if she had to take a shower and eat, she could start running the washing by 9, then it would be done by 11 or so. But she seemed to spend the entire evening watching TV, and would only get to washing past 11, almost daily too. Then I couldn't fall asleep till past one in the morning. I had to get up by six to get to work by seven, and it left me barely five hours to sleep at best. After a few weeks like that, I was going mad. I left a note on her door in the end. Couldn't she at least run it before ten? Then I should be able to sleep before twelve. And it seemed to have worked. My neighbor didn't run washing machine at all for the following few days, and for the first time since I moved into the flat, I could go to bed early and get an uninterrupted eight-hour sleep. Even after the first few days, she seemed to run washing at nine or ten now, and that was still good enough for me. A few months passed. One night, I was in bed already, but rudely woken up by the noises from the next door. It was well past one in the morning, but this time it wasn't the washing machine, but people arguing loudly. I put my ear to the wall. I couldn't make out what was said, but it was clearly between a woman and a guy. 
I didn't even know my neighbor lived with a guy. It escalated quickly, and I heard a woman scream and things breaking. Then I don't know who called, but police officers came. By then I forgot to sleep and watched what was unfolding through the small window to the hallway. The men argued with the officers fiercely for good ten minutes. It's none of your effing business, just leave us alone! And so on, while the woman sobbed behind him all the while. In the end, one officer turned to the woman. I need your clear verbal demand if you want us to remove him. Yes. Yes, I want that, please, the woman said, and the officers escorted the man away. The woman watched them go in the petrol car and said in a low voice, I'm sorry so late at night, before she went inside, as if she knew very well that I, or perhaps other neighbors, were eavesdropping. A week passed. Once again, I was rudely woken up by noises from the next door. This time, it was the washing machine. Oh God, not again, I thought, but just let it pass that night. But when the same thing happened the following night, I couldn't sleep at all because of sheer anger than the noise itself. I think I barely got an hour worth of snooze that night. I tried to understand. Maybe her life was messed up, which was not too difficult to speculate, considering what I witnessed a week prior. But still, I needed to sleep. When washing cycle ran for the third night in row, I banged on the neighbor's door at two in the morning. Hey, come out! I need to talk to you! I shouted, something I had never done before. What are you thinking to run washing machine at this time of the night? I got so mad that I didn't even know what I was shouting. I just had to do or say something to let out my steam. I could hear things go silent inside, yet I wasn't satisfied. Come out! I still insisted, knocking on the door. The door finally opened, but just a crack, and a hand and a half of the face appeared. It was the guy whom I saw escorted away by the police. He looked much older than his voice made me believe. Some fifty or something. What do you want? He said. I was caught a bit off guard because I was expecting the woman. Nevertheless told him that he shouldn't be running washing machines so late at night. So what? The man said with a cold stare, without any gesture of backing down. It somehow triggered a chill deep inside of me, and I didn't know how to react now. I'll keep it quiet now, so go back to bed, he said. I didn't want to deal with him anymore, so I did as I was told. I lied back down but couldn't sleep. I couldn't shake up the sticky hunch that something wasn't right. In the end, I got up and came out of the building. My flat was on sort of one and a half floor, just above the semi-basement level. One could quite easily look inside through the window if one stood on the wall. I climbed up the wall and tried to peep in my next door. The light was on inside, but the curtain was drawn all the way. But then I noticed the ventilation hall to what must be the bathroom. The flat building was rather old, low-end construction, and the ventilation hall was literally a hall covered with a thin plastic grill. Light in the bathroom was emitting from the hall. The wall I was standing on was very close to the building, so I reached the railing and barely managed to put my eye up to the hall. The plastic grill thingy partially obscured the view, but I could get an angle to get a view. On the basin inside was... an arm. 
I first thought either the woman or man was resting an arm there while sitting on the toilet. But something was off. If that were to be the case, it had to be a right arm, but it was a left hand there. Had a man then tied a woman there or something? I thought, and I lowered my angle to get a wider view. I noticed the arm was not attached to anything. There was no body to it. The arm was cut off. When I realized it, I was so shocked that I lost balance and fell from the wall. I must have fell on some sort of metal balls or bean that made a loud noise. But I couldn't care less how much it hurt. I just ran, couldn't even dare to look back. I ran, found a door to a neighboring flat building, jumped in, ran up several flights of stairs, and hid myself in the darkness. I shivered all over, but I was laser focused if the man would be after me. I was terrified that he might pop out from the corner and slash my throat. I waited for a good few minutes, but didn't detect anybody on the street. I had to call police, but I didn't have my phone or wallet and was scantily clad under my pajama pants and zip-up hoodie in the winter night. Maybe I could have knocked on any door and asked them to call police. But somehow, my shocked mind couldn't come up with such an idea. All I could think was, I should go back to grab my phone. I was so scared and tense that I could piss my pants. But I carefully had it back to my place, constantly looking and listening to all directions around me. I saw the light was now off at the next door. I took out my shoes before walking up the stairs. To lessen the noise of unlocking the door, I even took off my hoodie to wrap around the lock. My wild imagination was flashing the image of the guy jumping out to get me. But thank God, he didn't. I took my phone, wallet and a jacket and ran again. I reminded myself of the small police substation a block down and went there first. But the door was locked with a sign saying out on patrol. Damn, damn, damn. I called the emergency, but worried if they would believe my whole saga of peeping inside the next door and witnessing a severed arm. In the end, I made up a more plausible sounding story that I heard the fierce noise of fight and screams from my next door and they should check on them. Then I took a taxi and went to my parents. Only then I could somehow relax and feel safe enough. Following day, I called for a sick leave and stayed at my parents. In the afternoon, a colleague whom I'd been flirting with called me and asked if I was all right. What did she mean, I asked. And she told me a body was found near my place. It was all over the news already. Didn't I see it, she asked. Indeed, it was all over the news. Somebody tried to burn a body in the empty plot near my flat. When neighbors noticed the fire and called police, they found a charred body, missing two legs and an arm. It all happened around three in the morning, the report said. I could piece the puzzle of what happened. The man next door was alerted by the noise of me falling down and dragged out the body to the empty plot and attempted to burn it off. By the time I went to the local police substation, they must have been out to check on the complaint about the fire. And the noise from the washing machine? He must have run it to mask the noise of dismembering the body. 
if I had kept arguing with him the previous night, or been caught by him. My limbs too might have got sliced off next to the loudly running washing machine. Fortunately, the man was caught late in the evening. According to the report, he had a huge debt from his gambling habit, and that was the source of frequent trouble with his girlfriend. The missing legs and an arm were found in the drain pipe that runs underneath the nearby motorway. The man was arrested in the woman's flat, and I still believe he was back there despite all the risks, because he was waiting for me to return. Hi, it's Anthony here, and thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's stories, even though some of them were pretty gruesome. Thankfully, I spent most of my life in an independent houses and didn't have to suffer noise issue very often. But when I happened to stay in a various forms of apartment or multiplex and got to hear various sounds from washing machine to TV to even people living upstairs having sex, I can kind of understand how simple noise could degrade the quality of daily life. And I'm sure it's the very situation for some of my listeners too. Let me know if you ever had a particularly noisy neighborhood. If you enjoyed my work, please give it a thumbs up and a comment, and please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. If you'd support me more directly, I have a Buy Me A Coffee account, or you could also hit the super thanks here on YouTube for a small donation. Thank you. Until next Sunday, stay safe and keep the volume down.